When I was seven years old, my father gave me a book of fairy tales. I didn't know it back then, but it was the best gift ever. Um, I love the princess stories, of course, but my favorite were the scary ones, Hansel and Gretel. When I first read that story, it shocked me for days. It shocked me because I learned that parents could abandon their children on purpose, and worst of all, we could be eaten by hungry people. I looked at myself and thought, I'm just a piece of meat, and someone could come by and eat me. Um, and uh, the thought terrified me, but it also fascinated me. It still fascinates me today. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. How something as small as a fairy tale can stay with us throughout our lives. How we can use fairy tales to make sense of the world around us, and why we still need fairy tales today. Before I go on, I just want to let you know that uh, the illustrations I'm showing you today are from my friend, Amin Dawood, a talented artist. We're working on a fairy tale book together, so please enjoy my words as well as his art. My favorite um, author, Diana Wynne Jones, had this to say about fairy tales. Each fairy tale has a strange, true hidden fact in it. You can find it if you look for it. For as long as humans have existed, we have used stories to explain things we don't understand, like natural disaster, birth, the sun, the moon, to name a few. As we progress, these stories spread. Stories which combine our world and the mythical world with seemingly impossible plots. Elves coming in the night to make shoes for the shoemaker. Dead mothers who turn into magical swings. Fairy tales are the hallmark of our humanity. There is no other species on this earth that communicates through the telling of stories. And this is why we have survived and thrived today. This is why humans are so successful. We have been able to gather around a fire to exchange and collaborate information. Our ancestors knew they have to stay away from that cave because there's a hungry tiger in there waiting to eat them up. And they learned this through a story. There's true wisdom in these tales. Once upon a time, these stories were not just for children, they were for all of us, both young and old. In fact, the original fairy tales were laden with violence, sex, cruelty. But over time, of course, and as morality intervened, the stories became more diluted, more child-friendly. Even so, we continue to use fairy tales in our everyday lives. Despite our sophistication, our growing um, advances in uh, technology and science, there's something ingrained in us that compels us to view the world through the lens of such tales. And if we're not the one telling the stories, we are the greedy consumers of such stories. How many of us race to the cinema to watch the latest Marvel movie? Yeah? Thor, Black Panther, these are all stories originally based on myth and folklore. And this is the wondrous thing about fairy tales. They have evolve to cross across, to, to spread across cultures and borders. Fairy tales are the carriers of plots, endlessly reworked as we weave the narrative of our lives. So this is why fairy tales have thrived, but why do I love fairy tales? And why do I think we still need them today? The real fairy tales, not the ones written to give you a moral lesson. The real fairy tales, have very little pure morality in them. They are raw and basic and hit you right here in the heart and in the gut. Your emotions are dialed up a hundred times. You fall in love truly, madly, deeply. You die in the most brutal way ever. Yes, there's violence in these stories, but the violence is over the top, surreal. Even a child can see through it. For example, in the original Cinderella, the stepsisters were punished when birds came to pluck out their eyes. In the story of Batu Balah, Batu Batangkok, the haunted rock opens up to swallow the mother in despair, leaving her children motherless. So fairy tales can be brutal. But because we use the words once upon a time, this brutality can be accepted. 
We can say and do anything in fairy tales. Fairy tales, once upon a time, is, signifies to us that these fairy tales, these stories, aren't really for real. But of course, when we read them, we know that there's some element of truth in them. Fairy tales sometimes have a happily ever after, which is a great strength in these stories because there's hope that the hero will defeat the monster. But at the same time, there's also the fact that not all fairy tales end happily. And this is the power of fairy tales. Sometimes things don't work out. You get help, you find a solution. Do not despair, do not ever give up. This is the power of fairy tales. To me, the real value of a fairy tale is that it gets us talking. It forces us to have a conversation about life. And this conversation can be quite controversial. Innocence and seduction, Rapunzel, the original Rapunzel. Monstrosity and compassion, beauty and the beast, depression and despair, batu belah, batu betangkuk. Male domination and female empowerment, the story of Bayagom. Do you know this story? No? Bayagom was a man who found a beautiful fairy princess bathing in the river with her sisters. He decides to keep her for himself. So he steals her fairy wings and because of that she can't fly home back to Kayangan. And then he tricks her, manipulates her into marrying him. Now these are serious issues in a bedtime story for children. But we can use these stories to talk about difficult topics. We can use fairy tales to make sense of the world around us, to look into ourselves, to look at our moral compass. So by now, you all know I love fairy tales. But, <laughs> but there did come a point, I think I was around nine, when. I realized all the stories that I loved were about people who were so different from me. The girls had golden hair, their skin was white as snow. And I thought to myself, where are my fairy tales? Where are the stories about me? I looked for them. I found some, of course, and have recently retold these stories, like the story of the Crocodile King. This is about a weird crocodile. In Malaysia, we have weird crocodiles and weird tigers. So much cooler than werewolves. Um, the legend of Ulit Mayang about sea spirits um, who have serious uh, relationship issues. From Sabah, the Karazan Dusun people, the beautiful tale of the Mosquito Queen and the origin of Akinabali. Now, have you all heard of these stories? Are you more familiar with Little Red Riding Hood than these stories? Yes. yes. The answer, unfortunately, is yes, and it was that like that for me too, but I think it's time for that to change. We really need to focus on our fairy tales. I'm gonna pause here for a while to tell you a fairy tale. It's a, not a well-known one, but it shows how it still has an impact today. The tale is called The Tale of Hitamanis. I hope you enjoy it. Once upon a long time ago, in a land of lush jungles and green, green hills, there lived a beautiful maiden called Hitamanis. Her skin was as smooth and as dark as the midnight hour, and her smile as sweet as honey. Hitamanis worked in the palace gardens, but one night she was asked to serve the sultan and his prince. As she entered, she saw that the sultan was angry with his son. You are going to be Sultan one day. You must take your duty seriously. Yes, father, said the miserable prince. When the prince looked up, he saw Hitamanis and he was filled with a sudden intense love for the girl. Hitamanis looked at the prince and in that brief moment, everything changed. Unfortunately, the Sultan also saw the looks of love being exchanged and knew that this nonsense had to be stopped. The next day, Hitamanis was dancing in the garden, thinking of her handsome prince. She was joined by her friends. Unbeknownst to the girls, the palace guards had crept into the garden, bearing daggers of steel, for the sultan had given the order of death to Hitamanis. She leaped through the air, and a steel dagger pierced her heart. She fell down dead. The guards didn't know what to do with the other girls, and so they too were killed in the same brutal way. 
After the murder, something peculiar happened. The bodies shimmered and vanished into a dark mist. Shocked, the guards ran away, but not before they saw a swarm of bees flying to the jungle. The prince was distraught, but the royal shaman cast the forgetting spell on him, and soon he was back to his usual ways. Many, many moons later, the prince was in the jungle and found himself standing in front of a magnificent Tualang tree. Its silvery bark stretched up high into the sky and nestled in its branches were crescent-shaped moons, beehives, filled with the most delicious rainforest sun. With a wink and a smile, the prince climbed the tree carrying a pail and his steel dagger. He began to cut the honeycomb and after a while, the pail was lowered to the ground and the men saw what was in the pail. The prince had been murdered. His body chopped up and stuffed inside the pail. Oh, what will we tell the Sultan? His prince is dead. When the bees heard this, they flew down and surrounded the body of the prince. And as they flew away, the men found that the prince was alive and whole again. Just then, a voice came from the tree. I am Hitamanes. I loved you with all my heart, but I was killed for that love. Hitamanes, please come back to me, implored the prince, for his memory had returned. I can never be as I was. We are the rainforest bees, and we have our hives at the tops of the Tualang tree. Our honey is the sweetest in the land, but take heed. Never ever use a metal knife to cut me, for that was how I was murdered. The prince fell to the ground, his heart breaking into a thousand pieces. The end. So, I found that fairy tale uh, watching the Discovery Channel. <laughs> True story. Um, it's about, it was about a boy, a, a family who lived in Pera, who owned a Tualang tree with a hive of bees in it. And every honey hunting season, they would gather at the tree on a moonless night, and the appointed person would climb the tree. Now, the Tualang tree is the tallest tree in the rainforest, it's, so it's not easy to climb this tree. He would carry with him a leather pail and a knife made out of buffalo bone. They would never use a metal knife because of the story I just told you. He also carried with him a torch, a fire torch, and when he got to the hive, he would tap the hive gently, and as the embers of the fire fall down to the ground, the bees would, fall, well, the bees would follow the fire. And because it's a moonless night, they can't find their way back to the hive, leaving the man free to harvest the honey. Now, at the same time, the grandfather is singing to the bees this song, Oh hitam manis, turun dengan lembah lembut. Oh hitam manis, turun dengan cahaya bintang. Come down, dark sweetness, that's the bees. Come down softly and gently. Come down, dark sweetness. Come with the starlight. The starlight's the embers of fire. So this family knew of this fairy tale and heeded its warning till today. Isn't that amazing? I was so inspired by this that I wrote a short story called Johan the Honey Hunter, which won the I-Level um, Children's Literature Award. I use fairy tales in my short stories and my novels as a way to spread our stories. I, um, at the moment, I'm working on a novel which is influenced by the tale of Bayago and the Crocodile King, and my last novel incorporated myths surrounding, surrounding Mark Kinabalu. I'm also working on a very exciting project. I want to retell and rewrite 50 of our fairy tales. And I want to do them in the clearest possible way, the truest possible way, the most delightful way that I can. So there will not be any moral lessons to be learned from my tales. My tales will be a little bit brutal, slightly naughty, but also very, very true. And it's my hope that through these stories, I can spread our fairy tales to a whole new generation. And who knows what the effect of that would be. A storm can begin with a flap of a wing. Something as small as a fairy tale can start a whole new revolution in the way we think and imagine. Albert Einstein, the famous scientist, possibly the most intelligent person on, uh, on Earth, he said he had this to say about um, fairy tales. He was asked by a mother, oh, what should I read to my child to make him more intelligent? And he said this, if you want your child to be more intelligent, read them fairy tales. And she said, mm, yeah, okay, what else? What other books? 
And he said, well, if you want them to read, become more intelligent, read them more fairy tales. Think about this. This genius of a man did not tell the mother to send her child to tuition or read textbooks. He told her to read fairy tales to her child. What did he mean by this? I think he was talking about the power of imagination. You see, fairy tales have a very special structure. They are flat and simple. There's hardly any description, hardly any names. You're either the king or the monster or the witch. In fairy tales, things happen quickly. And this is why fairy tales are so amazing for our imagination. It forces us to make, to build images in our mind. It forces us to fill in the gaps. I would add one more thing to Einstein's quote, and it is this. Read our fairy tales. Read the stories that have come out of this beautiful country. Read the stories to exchange information, to collaborate, to debate difficult issues. Read our stories to be inspired, to find meaning and a way in which we can all learn from one another. I have a wish, and it is this, that my story can plant a tiny seed in the mind of a child or someone like yourself, and for that seed to be nurtured and to grow into something beautiful and useful and true. If I can do that for just one person, that would be my happily ever after. Thank you.